was Adam Wright. Thank you, Adam Address. Nineteen Brookdale Road. And today's date, please, sir. Twenty fifth of June, two thousand and eight. Adam Bright, recovering stone. When I leave here today, the rest of my life <coughs> begins. Today's date, the 27th of June, 2008. Stammering is what I do. I'm a person who stammers, so that's gonna that is a part of who, who I am, what I do. That in itself just takes the pressure off. So now, you know, if I stammer or whatever, I'll have a little block here and there. Whilst it's never as bad as it was pre starfish, actually, do you know? It's what I do. Why shouldn't I go and be involved in what I want to be involved in? Why shouldn't I go and join that conversation that's happening over the other side of the room? Why shouldn't I be able to put my hand up and say, I'm Adam Wright? That is what I do, and that is who I am. I believe that my sister um, started stammering, who's 18 months older than me and um, it's said that I started to copy her and then as my sister Natalie got to um, a bit older um, she just stopped as many children do when they stammer it's all part of growing up and um, learning to talk and everything like that so, complicated procedure so that they'll just stop at some point a proportion of children would so I think what happened then is my mum and dad thought oh Natalie's stopped she's 18 months older so we'll wait 18 months and then hopefully Adam will stop as well but 18 months comes four years comes, <laughs> 10 years comes, 15, you know, and here I am today still stammering. My name is Monica Smith and I'm a speech and language therapist and I have a particular interest and specialism in stammering, um, but I'm also a general speech and language therapist as well. So stammering is sometimes called stammering, could be called stuttering, Americans call it stuttering. Um, the sort of medical term is disfluency. Um, and I like the term disfluency because that really describes what it is. Because stammering or disfluency is the interruption of fluency. It's when fluent speech becomes less fluent or disfluent. Um, and there are three types of stammering behaviour that you can have. Um, the first one could be a repetition of sounds. Um, it could be the prolongation of a sound, so stretching out of a sound or it could be actual blocking, a physical blocking, and sometimes associated with that, you can have lots of physical characteristics like jerks, twitching, blinking, that can be alongside that. And that's the sort of overt stammering behavior. But stammering is also covert behavior and can be described as um, something which has covert behaviors attached to it. And so the covert behaviors would be things like word avoidance, situation avoidance, stress, anxiety, social phobia so there's quite it's quite a, a big area it's not just about the actual stammering what you can hear there's actually a lot of stuff that goes on b 
beneath the surface and that's why we use an iceberg often to describe it that the overt things are the things you can see out of the water and the covert behaviours, the anxiety, the stress, the avoidance of situations and the impact it's having on somebody's life are the things that you can't normally see quite so easily. People choose jobs because of their stammer. They choose all sorts of different behaviours. They'll choose hobbies. They'll not do things because of their stammer. And so the impact of the stammer is massive. And the impact of changing your life because of the way you speak or because of uh, the anxiety that you have about speaking can be huge and, and it has an impact on every other area of your life. And the long-term impact um, can be massive on your sort of emotional well-being and your mental health. Well, we use a thing called the, the multifactorial model to explain how stammering occurs. Um, and there are sort of four elements to the multifactorial model. The first one is physiological. Um, and that's just about our bodies and how we're built, really. Um, you're more likely to stammer if you're a boy, so if you're a male person. You're more likely to have a stammer if you've got someone in your family that stammers because we know the genetic link. Very, very recently, we've had some um, research going on at the moment about how our brains are forming. And there is an actual physiological, researchers are thinking there's a, a physiological element or some things that people who stammer when they've had their brain scanned, they've got something in common to do with the structure of their brain. So there's a physiological element. There is also a speech and language element. So anybody who has had any interruption to their development of speech and language, so somebody who's developed their speech and language as a child quite slowly, had some sort of uh, interruption to that or some disordered development, or it could be somebody that developed their speech and language really, really quickly, was a very quick talker. Um, and so, for example, they were very keen to speak um, and had some quite a lot of vocabulary, but perhaps had issues with grammar or with actual syntax, putting words into sentences. And then there are other elements too. There's personality, um, people who are very, very um, perfectionist, people who find failure very, very difficult to cope with. And then the other um, element is to do with your environment. So your actual communication environment is massively important. Um, people who find, who uh, perhaps communicate in a situation where they find it difficult to take turns, they're very, very tired. So fatigue can have a massive impact on stammering. Um, there are a whole massive amounts of, of reasons or, or situations that could mean that you're predisposed to be someone who stammers, but equally all these things could exist and you might not stammer. And the Michael Palin Centre, um, often in their training that I've been on, will just say that actually it's just down to just luck, luck of the draw. It's one of those things you will either get it or you won't. Um, and it's very, very difficult to pinpoint the actual reason why. And it's less important for me as a speech and language therapist as to, to actually know why. It's just about how all these, imp all these other things impact on your talking and impact on your fluency. That's what I'm interested in. So the Starfish project was set up by Anne and David Blight. They wanted to set something up that was non-profit making and provided people that stammer with a way of trying to control their speech so it was set up and um, it's gone from strength to strength there's a, a course that's held every month of the year i first became aware of starfish there was a documentary on tv and it was about a young lad i think his name was cameron and he was going through the starfish course and I was watching it and I remember, you know, thinking, wow, that's amazing. He's done so well. But I was still watching it. I was still very sceptical. Um, you know, I'd, I'd done things before and they hadn't worked. So I was still, why, you know, why is this going to be any different? You know, it's worked for that person or it, it will work for other people, but, you know it won't work for me. So at the time I was working as an unqualified social worker and I knew potentially there could be an opportunity for me to get seconded through work to go and get my qualification and work as a qualified social worker. I knew if I went and got qualified there'd be no hiding place 
whereas a, as an un, as an, an as a unqualified worker there is a bit of a hiding place if you like because you're not thrust into the into big meetings you can ask your manager to come with meetings with you or a qualified worker so there's all, there was a bit of a hiding place there um so i enrolled i applied for this secondment opportunity um which was really good because there was lots of people interested successful so on one hand i'm going get in on the other hand i'm thinking i hope this course works so i think I, I, i went on the course um i was thinking i was one year into my university course all hopes pin really on on the starfish course having a positive impact and i was still a bit skeptical you know i remember driving down to the course and there's a big roundabout not far from where the course is housed and i can still remember driving that roundabout two or three times before i thought just exit (laughs) exit where you need to exit and just get it done the first thing i remember about on the course is that evening when everybody meets up for the first time for the first time ever really i was around other stammerers and other people doing and when you talk about those crazy things like talking to somebody on the end of the phone when nobody's even there i do that and just that sense of it's not only me the next day when the course really kicks in um, I remember watching a video of somebody that I'd met the previous night and watching how their speech was before they went on that course. And I remember watching it, you know, and, it, and, and it's so vivid in my memory. So they put the video on and this was pre him going on the course. And I'm thinking... This isn't the same person. This is not the same guy that I met last night. And I'm like, I want that. I want whatever he has, whatever he's got, I want. I want that. And from that moment forward, I was in. I was 100%. Whatever anybody said to me, I was listening. I was absorbing because I wanted that. Because I knew that I wasn't. I wasn't going to come away from the course and never stammer again because that's explained to you that this isn't a cure you know a cure doesn't exist but i i just i just wanted something that i knew i could work with just to give me just to give me some think um so i i I knew that i had something and with that i was more than happy having something that i could use or could work with. For me, what sets Starfish aside to other other courses or particularly other things I've tried is the fact that it's not just a four day course, it, it's, it's the rest of your life. So you kind of leave and it's just the beginning of the journey really. There is so much support around you that you you can access a local support group so there's support groups all across the country that run that everybody's doing exactly the same thing they've been on the course they're working on the same things that you are and that um support network is what makes for me what what makes starfish work so Support group time, support group evening. Looking forward to it. So it was good. So it was great to uh, catch up with the rest of the group in person. It's always good to spend time with other people that are working on the same things that you're working on. Can offer a bit of advice, help you, maybe suggest something that you've not thought of before, and just and just being around other people that stammer and have the same. Um, daily challenges that can you relate to really good tonight we've got a lot of 
regulars missing through work commitments, working away at the moment that uh, nine times out of 10 would be here. People lead busy lives and whatnot, but most of the time people will um, pri prioritise coming to the group because if they don't, it affects their speech. So people want to work at it, people want to keep it up and know how important it is. We've used the time to talk to another support group, Starfish Support Group in Plymouth, done some questions to quizzes and it's been good speech technique, good to interact with another support group and then after that we just had a little discussion to how we thought it went and some feedback so yeah it's been a, a good meeting. Um, for many years I never really spoke about my stammer and my speech so now it's my favourite subject and to be able to be open about it is half the battle. It really, really is. It was recently results day um, and there was this video going on uh, to sort of see how people reacted to it to, and uh, how well they thought they did and everything. And because I just got my results and they just shoved me in front of a camera, my stammering was awful. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, but, but you know, I'm glad that I've done it because, because if I wouldn't have done it, I would have felt, I would have felt worse about it. Me, you know, letting the stammer sort of win, if you get know what I mean. So, so I'm glad that I did it, and I'm sort of glad that I've stammered because, because it's all uh, pushing myself out of my comfort zones. Stammering is something you hope won't get passed through, but um, stammering does run in my family, and unfortunately for me, it was passed down to Matthew. Like me, he's you know he's influence. He isn't always perfect, but he's come a long way, and he's 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 in a good place. And long may may long may that continue. There was this uh, kid in year seven who stammered, and uh, and he'd been struggling with it quite a lot. So one of the teachers actually got me to sit down with him, and uh, and talk to him, just not to like help him, but just to know that you know that there's other people out there because I know how lonely it can get being a kid with a stammer. So. Um, that, that was good for him, I think. I hope it was anyway. As soon as I met Adam, I could tell he was somebody who was very keen to take his recovery as far as he could take it. And he will take this as far as he can take it. And I still think he has plenty of mileage to go, yeah. There's no stopping him. You know, you can see in himself he's a more positive person. He's, you know, he just comes across as a confident, individual and um, whether you've got a stammer or not you know that, that's a good a asset to have. I think what still gives me really good satisfaction even today is when the phone rings and I pick it up and I say Adam Wright. For me whilst that's a really small thing or um, most people would, would just take that for granted. That still, I know, you know, when I go into work next and the phone rings, I still get a buzz out of doing that because it was something I, I, I would never have been able to have done before. Adam Wright. Yeah, hi. I'm good, thanks. Yeah, sounds good. And from the phone, well, yeah, I would definitely have got out if, if I could, ignoring it, say, oh, like I didn't hear it ring or, or something like that, yeah. So to be able to, to do that now is, is something that I never thought I, was, I would do. And to be able to do it with confidence as well and know if I do things right, I can answer with my name and stuff like that is a uh, pretty life changing really. When I was young, you know, there was no real understanding. There was no, you know, I can never remember a teacher or anybody really talking to me about it. Um, obviously, kids are cruel, aren't they? And, you know, the lack of understanding 
standing and everything else. Of course, there's a lot of Mickey taking. Um, I can remember one. Something that always sticks in my mind for some reason is somebody came up to me once and said, my mum thinks you should be in a special needs school. High men's school. This is uh, where I spent four years. And uh, yeah, whilst in some ways a good four years with a good group of lads in other ways presented me with uh, lots of difficulties, people not really understanding, um, kind of dreaded coming each day really because you, you, you didn't know what was going to happen, whether you were going to be asked to read something in English or do something in assembly or whatever, so you never quite knew. So it was always a bit of apprehension walking through the gates in the morning, not knowing what was going on. Yeah, some kind of good memories in some ways, but other ways, yeah, tough times, tough. You would kind of never be you either. So, you know, the teacher asks a question and you know what, you know what the answer is, but you know, no way you're gonna put your hand up and answer the question um, as well you you know you've got that in English as well where you go around the class and you all read two or three pages of a book so you know it's coming to you so you know the teachers said right we're going to read I don't know, four paragraphs each so I'd be quickly totting up in my head how many people have before for me and then I'll be quickly you know jumping ahead in the book going okay so that's my bit okay so what G's are in there what D's are in there what B's are in there which is probably the worst thing I could have done um, because it would have been better re reading it without knowing and then as, as that as your you know tenth person in a way nine eight you know your heart rate begins to increase and you can feel your heart going you're starting to sweat a bit because you know it's you and by the time it's you you're that worked up that you're not worried about just your difficult sound you're worried about every sound because you're you're so worked up but you would have to struggle through it and still complete whatever the task was. Um, so nothing's simple really, because your you, your your voice is who you are. It's how you. It's what people can see of you. It's how you d display who you are, your personality, and all, all all those sorts of things. And if you can't do that, that that. The way people perceive you can be com completely different and you're not happy in yourself because you're not being true to who you are. Growing up, I can remember um, sitting at home one day in uh, the lounge. I can't remember how old I was, but probably 11, 12, something like that. And a TV advert came on the TV and it was trying to get adults back into education by going back into college and doing courses. Call now for free courses. Get rid of your gremlins and get on. What are you doing, Petal? It's not for us. Oh, why do we need to learn? He's a clever kid. He won't need our help. And remember, we never find a time. No, you don't. Let's put it down. Yeah. That's it. I remember sitting there and thinking, blimey, that's my stammer that is. Them gremlins there sitting on that person's shoulder, they represent my stammer. They come with me every, they come with me all day, every day, dictate to me what I can do, what I can't do. I want to go and join in a conversation. That gremlin pops up. What are you doing that for? You you can't say what you want to 
say, you can't do that. They followed me around all day, every day. They were there when I woke up in the morning and they were still there when I went to bed at night. For me now, I've been through Starfish. If I was to struggle on a word, if that's somebody that I know and know what I've done at Starfish, you know, I'd want them to remind me of the technique so I could say the word. If this is to somebody that doesn't know me or I've met in a restaurant or whatever, he's just be patient and um, let me say what I want to. My advice would be to anybody who is working with somebody who's got a stammer, so a teacher or a parent, or you've got a friend who stammers, the biggest piece of advice I would give you is just to give them time and to wait for them to say what they've got to say. Um, finishing people's sentences, although it's very tempting, is really, really unhelpful sometimes because for a start off, you might be actually giving them the wrong words sometimes and they've got to start all over again. So just waiting and maintaining the eye contact and making sure the person you're talking to is relaxed and realises that you're ready to wait and you're interested in what they're saying rather than how they're saying it. Because actually, fundamentally, that is the most important thing. It's the actual content of what somebody's saying. It's far more important than the actual way that they're saying it. The good thing about any sort of speech technique or finding the thing that works for you is that the impact is not just on your fluency, but it's also on your self-esteem. It affects everything, doesn't it? You know, self-esteem and confidence is the thing, is the sort of fuel we need to get by every day. Um, and anything that's going to help you has a knock-on effect, and that's the thing with fluency. But anything that's going to improve confidence and make you want to speak to a variety of people will take the sort of fear out of those unknown situations so if you're speaking more and feeling more confident about speaking to lots of different people in lots of different places that's only going to be for the good i think as, as a general advice for you know it's, it's just to you know just smile and, and just keep eye contact with people and just let them kind of do what they need to do to be able to get the word out, I suppose. So just on my way to mum and dad's house now to talk uh, to my mum and dad about my stammer and you know, I'm really interested to see what they have to say about what I was like as a child and growing up and what they thought of my speech so yeah let's go and find out what they have to say about it i remember you telling uh, the other day about um you was in a pub with all your mates and it came up to your round and you went up to the bar and whoever served you or whatever um, thought you was either drunk or on drugs and they got the bouncers and threw you out because you couldn't speak properly um, and you said your mates even to this day don't realise that you'd been thrown out and they thought you got out of paying for a round of drinks thought that was uh, awful in a way but because you wouldn't talk about it because you wouldn't that's your stammering mindset that you wouldn't say Oh, it was be, it was because I couldn't get any words out. You would let that Mickey taking or panter happen. That actually you were just trying to not. You didn't want to get around, and you would just let that happen and just think, oh, just laugh, laugh it off, because you don't want to admit what had really happened. When we went to Starfish with you earlier this year, it was earlier this year. Um, me and your mum, we, we, we learnt an awful lot of what you'd gone through when we were seeing the other people uh, on the same course and, and in just a few days how they'd improved, very emotional um, and I think it was so important that we'd seen that, I wish we'd have done that years ago, we might have been able to help you more um, and the importance of all those people on Starfish um, and, and I said this at the end because we, we were at the back of the room and they asked us to speak um, the importance of all the people there and it weren't just kids there was uh, quite a few uh, professional people etc um, the importance of taking your spouse 
or your children or your parents so they can understand what you're going through. Um, it was a big eye opener to us, big eye opener to us. And I think at Starfish as well was, was the first thing that I actually understood that it was an electrical thing in the brain and that sort of helped me with the guilt. The fact that it actually meant that probably it wasn't something I had actually done, which I actually thought it was. So I think it actually helped me. I remember the few things I regret that we didn't know um, the sort of things you was going through, obviously at school and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I always remember and I regret it to this day that we went to a football match somewhere and you were in the back of the car and you was with, with my mates, I don't know if you remember that. Um, we were having a conversation and you started to talk and you really had problems. And I think I was driving um, and I remember and I regret it to this day, I, sh I shouted at you and told you off and said, will you stop that and talk properly? And now I think about it, I I feel awful about it. Having my stammer has kind of moulded me. It's kind of moulded me into the person that I am. I think it's helped me in my career to get to where I am today in the work that I do in social work. I think it's given me a lot of empathy for other, other people, made me think about life in a in a different way. Somebody said to me once, you don't just talk differently, you walk differently. And I, and I was like, what, you what? And when they explained it, they said that pre-starfish, or when I'm walking into a room, so the first thing in the morning, for instance, day at work, I would generally walk in and they would say my head would be down because I didn't want to make eye contact with people because you'd get that good morning how are you so you know just try and avoid it and they said now when you walk in you've got your head held high and you are you know you you're the one to say good morning and that you know that's priceless so when I met my wife Helen I'd already knew Helen because we were at school to Together, but even though we were at school together, I kind of knew who she was. She knew who I was, but we never really mixed. So she knew I. So she, you know, everybody in in, in the school knew I had a stammer. So it was no big. It was no big sh shock. Um, and then we started working together at the same time at the hospital. So we kind of started. Um, so there was no. You know, there wasn't any, although obviously it was still difficult to talk to her, having a stammer, because I, I knew, she knew I stammered, that kind of took a bit of the fear away, I suppose. So it was easier doing that. Um, but I remember her talking to me about my stammer and I'm kind of saying, no, it, it doesn't bother me, you know, I'm absolutely fine. And obviously that was a pack of lies but that's what you do you you kind of don't speak honestly about it because you don't want people to think it's it's bad but that's a bit about the stammering mindset that's what it does to you I remember kind of getting engaged and then started thinking about the wedding and thinking I've oh got in my vows I've got I've got you know a speech is expected of me. Although I was always very, very nervous thinking back then that I was going to have to do it. I can't think of a time when I thought, no, I'm not going to do it, um, which surprises me, <laughs> really. I suppose it's the expected thing, isn't it? You know, the groom gets up and he does his thank yous and those sorts of things, but I would never volunteer here to get up and, and, and speak in front of people. Calmly, like that, look, is it? Look, you've got a point in your hand, they're coming to you off you, look. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm 
well, I was hoping I could have that. I was going to help me through it. Um, it's been a magnificent day, and I'm so happy that all our friends and family are all here to hear it with us. So thank you to everybody. It really does. I have more hair there, Dad. I have, yeah. Yeah, I have. Got a lot more hair there. <laughs> this bit of the, the G of Gwyneth. I, I, I always knew I was going to struggle there. Also, we'd like to thank Chris and Gwyneth. Making the world's bridesmaid passes. Um, thank you for that lovely. Wait, so this is the bare minimum of the thank yous that have to be done. Yeah. Obviously, I think everybody was nervous, but I was absolutely on tender hook, tender hooks. Um, and all the way through it, I was going, go on, keep going, keep going, keep going. And you could feel. Uh, the tension in the room and when you'd finished it's like everybody seemed re relieved and everybody yeah and you, you can tell by the applause you had at the end how well you'd done well proud of you well proud of you so we're back at the chase hotel in Nuneaton this is where we had our evening reception where the speech took place so it's uh it's good to be back looks a bit different obviously that's what 15 years does um, but yeah, this is where, where it was. I can remember coming and arriving and then it's like, right, we're here now. This is where the, this is where the speech happens and the real nerves really setting in um, to what was about to happen that evening. Every time I come here, every time I walk past the room, I always think about you know that evening and what a great night it was, but also, you know, that speech is, is, isn't always, it's not that too far from our thoughts, you know. That's just, that's that stammering mindset, I suppose. That's what, you know, they, it wants me to remember it. Um, but now, you know, I try and re remember it in a, in a positive way. I've now started up a, a, a YouTube blog or a, vlog i think the youngsters would call it i wanted to one raise awareness two push my own comfort zones and challenge my own speech but also i wanted some for people to have somebody to relate to and to show other people that stammer whether they might be young or whether they're old that actually there is help out there and and you can do something about your speech i'd always wanted to go on fan cams i really love what the villa of you do um and i wanted to be a part a part of it but then that old stammering mindset that old um thought processes go through your head you know your kind of gremlins if you like that always used to have a kind of appear from nowhere you know it's getting towards the end of the game i'm kind of thinking right he's i'm going to be on soon we're going to have to go and do it soon then i'm kind of thinking though you know gremlin suddenly pop up on his shoulder and they say do you know adam you'd be so much easier not bothering doing it jump in the car beat the traffic much e e easier doing it that way so, you know, I went and did it and ignored that, you know, and, and that, and I love doing that. I love ignoring whenever those gremlins, they don't pop up very often nowadays, but when they do and they're telling me something that, you know, I can't do, you know, that, that's, you know, I really like to do it. And then so, ha, really, really pleased that I did it and I was able to, to combine raising awareness of stammering and talking about Aston Villa. So the future for me is to keep 
pushing my comfort zones to keep doing things, to keep putting myself out there, keep doing stuff like the Villa View fan cams, to keep doing stuff like this, what I'm doing now, to keep the message out there that, do you know what, I stammer, but it's absolutely fine. And I think that's the message. And whilst you might need a bit of recovery, you might need a bit of therapy to help you get to that point, that's ultimately the message to say, I stammer, and do you know what? That's absolutely okay.